most interesting thing will be to connect your neocortex to the cloud. I can't communicate wirelessly with the cloud today. I do that through my devices. So this, I have to take the device out and use my fingers, my eyes. Uh, we'll do that directly from my neocortex because these devices, they'll be communicating with each other on a local area network within your brain and also communicating with the internet and the cloud and they will extend <coughs> human thinking. So it, I mean, one scenario is just to do information services like search and translation directly from your brain without having to bother to take out these devices. And there is a communication uh, bottleneck and that it's particularly slow to type on these little devices or you can use speech, but that's also slow. So we'll be able to do it directly from our brain, but that's not even the most interesting thing. The most interesting thing will be for your neocortex to extend itself with synthetic neocortex in the cloud. So your smartphone, I mentioned, <coughs> is several billion times more powerful uh, per dollar than the computer I used when I was an undergraduate because of the exponential growth. But it can then multiply itself another million fold by connecting to a million computers in the cloud. Uh, the most inter interesting things that happen with your smartphone, doing a search or translation or some other type of intelligent transaction, uh, doesn't take place in the device, even though it's a billion times more powerful per dollar than computers from circa 1960s. Uh, it takes place in the millions of computers it communicates with wirelessly. We can't do that from our brains directly. We do it indirectly, as I mentioned, through these devices. We'll do it directly, and the most interesting application will be to actually connect to synthetic neocortex. It works just like the, your biological neocortex. Uh, and your thinking then will be a hybrid of your biological thinking, the 300 million neocortical modules we all have, and a certain number of neocortical modules that are simulated in the cloud. Now, uh, the cloud is pure information technology. It is subject to the law of accelerating returns. It is doubling in power now every year as we speak. That will continue. So remember, I mentioned two million years ago, we got this additional neocortex in our foreheads. Uh, that was a one-shot deal because that made our skulls bigger, made childbirth challenging. Uh, they couldn't keep growing because childbirth would have been impossible. So it was a one-shot deal, but it was enough additional neocortex to put us over the threshold to invent language and art and science and technology. And now technology is going to pick up from what happened two million years ago uh, this additional neocortex that's synthetic that's in the cloud, that won't be a one-shot deal. That's going to continue to expand. That's going to be subject to the law of accelerating returns. Ultimately, our thinking will be predominated by the synthetic neocortex. It's going to ultimately be so powerful and so smart, it'll be able to fully understand the biological part and model it and back it up. And one of the nice things about any digital technology is it's backed up. Uh, that's not true of, of our brains yet. Uh, so pe people talk about capturing the mind file. Well, the mind file will be largely in the cloud because our thinking will be largely in the cloud. And as I say, the cloud will ultimately be smart enough to kind of understand what's going on in the biological part. So all of it will be backed up. So at that point, uh, we are a hybrid, but the hybrid is largely becomes sort of cloud-based, you know, as we go into the 2040s. That's really the singularity, uh, you know, in the, by the middle of the 2040s. Um, and as for knowing who's who, I mean, that's an issue already. I mean, people communicate uh, in the cloud by going into some chat room and uh, it's already an issue. Are people really who they say they are? And there can be forms of abuse using that where people claim to be someone else and, uh, or forms of uh, economic theft. And there's all kinds of negative scenarios that are done today. Uh, and we're increasing our technology to verify who's who. Uh, I think actually that 
uh, capability is outpacing the ability of people to fool other people, but we're not there yet. Privacy is a big issue because, oh my God, if all my thinking is in the cloud, uh, I'll lose my privacy. But actually, your thinking is already in the cloud. I mean, all your email and messages and pictures and so on, that's all in the cloud. And the, t the technology of privacy is actually outpacing the technology of disrupting privacy. Encryption is the basis of privacy and encryption technologies have outpaced decryption. There was a time when people said, oh my goodness, uh, quantum computing's coming and that's gonna be able to break any encryption code and that'll be the end of privacy. Uh, quantum computing has not come. I don't, I'm dubious it ever will. Uh, quantum encryption though has come and even just PGP, pretty good privacy uh, using large uh, factored numbers if you use, you know, like 200-bit encryption, it's essentially unbreakable. You could, have, you could turn every, ultimately you could turn every molecule into a computer in the universe and you wouldn't be able to break it in a billion years if you had enough bits of encryption. And you'd only need like a thousand bits for that. Um, so we actually know how to keep information safe. I think ultimately privacy is, uh, is alive and well. There are legitimate social issues. I mean, people want law enforcement to catch uh, terrorists before uh, they cause destruction, but that means uh, invading the privacy of, of those terrorists. Uh, so there are, there are real sort of social political issues and where the proper balance is. Um, but the, you know, it's not our thinking going to the cloud that uh, is makes the issue of authentication of people's identity an issue. It, it is already.